Hi, and welcome back to the Bearded Historian. Contrary to widespread belief, World War I truly deserves to be called a world war, and the trench warfare of the Western Front, while certainly being one of the most depicted topics, wasn't by any means the only theater of interest in this global conflict. Spanning the four years from 1914 to 1918, the war saw battles being fought in Europe, China, the Balkans, the Ottoman Empire, the Middle East, and even in large parts of Africa. After all, many European nations have had wide-reaching colonial ambitions in the centuries leading up to the war, and unsurprisingly so, many of these overseas territories soon found themselves drawn into the expanding conflict. German East Africa was no exception to that rule, and saw a German general rise to prominence by leading a small force to victory against all odds, essentially remaining undefeated in the field for all of the war while operating a large guerrilla campaign that earned him the nickname the Lion of Africa. Paul Emil von Leto Vorbeck was an experienced member of the German general staff, having seen combat in China and Namibia before being promoted to lieutenant colonel and assigned command over the German colonial forces, the so-called Schutztruppe, in the region of German East Africa, which is modern-day Tanzania mostly. He arrived in the province in April 1914 and took a first inventory. His troops barely numbered 3,000 men in total and consisted primarily of locally recruited African soldiers, the so-called Askari, led by a small contingent of German officers. The force overall was poorly equipped and widely dispersed in the colony, their rifles were mostly outdated and the firepower was only supplemented by very few artillery guns. However, at the time, von Leto Vorbeck's primary mandate was to keep peace in the province and ensure that German colonial rule was not undermined by any local forces. As such, his small army was sufficient enough and had served its purpose well. A conflict with the neighboring colonial powers of Britain, Belgium and Portugal wasn't expected as the so-called Congo Conference of 1884 had seen all relevant parties agree that their African colonies would remain neutral in case of any European conflict. And when news of the German general mobilization arrived in East Africa on August the 2nd, it at first appeared von Leto Vorbeck may be observing the upcoming conflict from the sidelines. Heinrich Schnee, the German colonial governor of East Africa and von Leto Vorbeck's nominal superior, was committed to maintaining the agreed-upon neutrality. An order was issued to relocate all German troops out of the important coastal towns of the colony as a gesture of good intentions to their British neighbors. Having only been in the colony for very few months at that point, Lieutenant Colonel von Leto Vorbeck at first complied with the order, but soon began to hatch plans of his very own. When three days later, on August 5th, word arrived of a British attack on German river outposts near Lake Victoria, von Leto Vorbeck's mind was set. He bypassed his superior and began preparing his troops for a conflict that he deemed unavoidable. The strategist in von Leto Vorbeck had to face one crucial truth from the very beginning of the conflict. He neither had the manpower nor the resources to fight an offensive campaign in a theater of war that saw him outgunned and surrounded by enemies on all fronts. Instead, he decided on a daring strategy to bind as many Allied troops and resources in the region, therefore preventing these military assets to be used against the German Empire in the battle for Europe. For now, the numerical balance of forces was still relatively even and Britain had to primarily rely on their battalions of the King's African Rifles stationed along the colony's borders. In response, von Leto Vorbeck soon began amassing the bulk of his troops in the northern region of the colony and first small-scale engagements started breaking out. On August 15th, 
the German forces took a first offensive action and sent two companies of 300 native Askari soldiers to capture the British border town of Taveta. Only nominal resistance was met and the British garrison retreated in good order. In further efforts to disrupt enemy operations, raise the threat level and bind as many enemy forces as possible, German raiding parties soon began targeting the so-called Uganda Railway in multiple concerted efforts. The railway connected inland Nairobi to Mombasa and was of crucial infrastructural importance to the British colony. As von Leto Forbeck had hoped, striking here soon forced the British to react and allocate more resources to the region. The Indian Expeditionary Forces B and C, a total of 12,000 men, were shipped into British East Africa and prepared for a two-pronged assault on the German colony. Swift and decisive action was to put an end to German ambitions in the region. The British plan was elegant in its simplicity. While a force of 4,000 soldiers would advance around Mount Kilimanjaro to capture the eastern terminus of the Usambara Railway, the remaining 8,000 men would attempt an amphibious assault on the coastal town of Tanga, the western terminus of the same railway line. If successful, the assaults would completely break German defences in the northern colony and take control of crucially important railway connections. As their ships started arriving at Tangar on November 2nd, the assault force was facing little more than 100 garrisoned Askari in the town. An immediate attack would have most likely resulted in swift victory. Instead, this is where the plan, perfect on paper, slowly began to fall apart. Being unaware of the enemy's weak numbers, one of the fleet's captains was dispatched to formally request the town's surrender. However, a shrewd local German official argued successfully that he would have to consult with his superiors before a full surrender could be offered and also informed the captain to stay clear of Tanger's harbour for it was heavily mined. Neither of the official statements was true, but they bought the Germans important time to react to the enemy's arrival. Word was immediately sent to von Leto Forbeck, who didn't hesitate a moment in mobilizing all available troops along the Usambara railway towards Tanga. In the meantime, the British had begun sweeping the harbour for mines, but as a result had also decided to land their troops three miles away from the town itself. More than a day after their arrival, on the evening of November 3rd, all British troops had finally disembarked unchallenged and were preparing for the upcoming assault. At that point, however, enough time had passed for the Germans to hastily scramble a defence. Just hours before the attack began, von Leto Forbeck arrived in Tanga with almost 1,000 men and concealed defensive lines were drawn up facing the enemy. At noon on November 4th, the assault began. 8,000 British troops were facing little more than 1,100 German defenders. On their right flank, the 2nd Loyal North Lancashire Regiment made good progress and soon the fighting swept into Tanger itself. Fierce counterattacks eventually stopped their advance and led to a stalemate, but the town had been turned into a brutally contested battleground. On the left flank, however, events took a different turn. Less well-trained and equipped Indian battalions soon lost their cohesion and coordination while advancing through dense undergrowth and unknown territory. Upon reaching the German lines, a fierce firefight broke out, but a German counterattack with heavy machine guns soon broke the attacker's last resolve. The ensuing chaos saw the whole left flank rout under heavy casualties and shortly thereafter, the right flank had to follow suit if not to be surrounded by enemy forces completely. The battle had been lost decisively, and if it weren't for a miscommunication amongst the German officers, many more casualties would have most likely been inflicted in the following hours of chaotic retreat. Instead, the German troops disengaged and started to consolidate behind their own front lines. 
Under the white flag of truce, the dead and wounded were cared for and retrieved on the next day. The British had suffered heavy casualties, with some estimates being as high as 800 dead, while the Germans had only lost about 70 of their men. The British commander ordered a general withdrawal, leaving a victorious Paul von Leto Vorbeck to contemplate the consequences of his first major engagement with the enemy. Flawed intelligence reports and a strong German defensive position had also seen the Expeditionary Force C fail their objectives in the battle for Mount Kilimanjaro. Outnumbered 4 to 1, the German troops held their line and caused the British offensive plans to fail altogether. The enemy assault had been completely deflected and von Leto Vorbeck was able to capture vast stores of equipment and ammunition left behind in hasty retreat. Askari companies were re-equipped with modern rifles and 16 new machine guns were distributed among the force. With morale and combat readiness now higher than ever, von Leto Vorbeck soon led his troops into another successful engagement, the Battle of Jessin, in January 1915. The engagement resulted in another swift German victory, but in light of the losses, also helped von Leto Vorbeck realize that an open confrontation wasn't a feasible long-term approach to achieve his strategic objectives. Instead, he redirected his efforts towards a revitalized guerrilla campaign by picking up concentrated raiding operations against the Uganda Railway again. For the British, the November offensive had been nothing short of a full disaster. In consequence, the decision was taken to assemble a large fighting force of South African troops in British East Africa to end this conflict once and for all. But these troop movements would take time and gave von Leto Vorbeck precious breathing room to build up his own forces and continue his incursions into the neighboring enemy colony. 1915 passed without any major engagements, while both sides continued amassing troops. Though this time, the British and their allies took great care to fully bring their numerical superiority to bear. Approximately 100,000 men, a mixture of South African, British and African troops, combined with their Belgian and Portuguese allies, were facing a mere 14,000 men on the German side. Beginning in March 1916, the British-led offensive simultaneously moved into German East Africa from almost all surrounding territories and quickly gained ground. Von Leto Vorbeck knew from the very start that a direct confrontation such as in Tanga was no longer an option. In fact, he had prepared for the scenario for a while now and moved to concentrate all his efforts on conducting a very mobile guerrilla warfare with hit and run style attacks on the large enemy contingents. Split in multiple smaller columns, his troops aimed to outmaneuver the invading forces and hinder their advance wherever a favorable opportunity presented itself. And while the fighting certainly affected the enemy's progress somewhat, it was primarily disease and unfamiliarity with the territory that took the greatest toll on the Allied troops. <coughs> Regardless of all efforts though, von Leto Vorbeck continuously had to retreat southwards and eventually saw first losses as some of his columns got defeated in battle or surrounded and captured. Nevertheless, he continued to fight on and faced the enemy in one last pivotal battle at Mahiva. While ultimately gaining victory again, it was a very costly one for the newly promoted General Major. Manpower and supplies were running extremely low and von Leto Vorbeck had no other choice than to continue his retreat. The British were following them very closely and yet he and his men managed to evade capture time and time again. So regardless of how elusive they were, room to outmaneuver the enemy was shrinking with every passing day and in November 1917 von Leto Vorbeck decided in a bold move to take his remaining force of just 1900 men into enemy territory itself. 
Leaving behind all wounded soldiers and unnecessary equipment, von Leto Forbeck had led his troops into Portuguese Mozambique and continued their fight against an unprepared and ill-trained colonial defense force. By capturing and raiding supply depots, his remaining men managed to keep going, but shortages in essential supplies and ammunition had become a constant companion. With the British always hard on their heels, the game of cat and mouse continued as von Leto Forbeck marched his column into Rhodesia, which he suspected to be free of British troops. In the remoteness of this province, his force could possibly find some much-needed respite. Here, however, pillaging through Rhodesia and long cut off from effective communications with German Central Command, the General Major received a message on November 13, 1918. Two days after the events had unfolded in Europe, he was informed about the armistice that would soon end World War I. A ceasefire was agreed and just two weeks later, on November 25th, the General Major, Paul Emil von Leto Forbeck, formally surrendered to the British. With just 1300 men remaining, the struggle had finally come to an end. He had avoided capture and defeat until the very end and would go down in history as the only German commander to ever successfully invade British imperial soil during World War I. His achievements were respected, if not praised, by historians and observers on both sides of the war. But were they worth it? Did von Leto Forbeck actually achieve what he had originally set out to do? His activities had forced the Allies to deploy some 250,000 soldiers to the region throughout the four years of fighting and invest considerable amounts of money and war material that could have otherwise gone to other fronts. Yet his success was only a partial one. Material and monetary investments aside, he had failed to divert additional manpower from Europe after 1916, as the Allied forces primarily relied on African and other colonial troops. Casualties were also limited on both sides, as the fighting took place on a much smaller scale than in most of the other conflict zones. Estimates give British total losses at 10,000 soldiers for the whole conflict in East Africa. In comparison, the first day of the Battle of the Somme alone cost 20,000 British soldiers their The true tragedy, as is so many times in war, was the impact this conflict had on the local civilian population. Though we lack detailed records, through direct and indirect consequences of the war, the loss of civilian life in the region is estimated to be anywhere between 300 and 700,000. The African population had paid the price for a war instigated by the European colonial rulers. Going back to our opening statement, I can only repeat myself. World War I was a truly global conflict and I hope this video helped to explore how one of the lesser known theatres of conflict fit into this bigger picture. As always, I invite you to leave your thoughts and comments below and hope to be back with another video in the near future. And don't forget to subscribe if you like what you saw. I'll put a direct link on the screen in just a split second.